Glad y'all here, and uh, we'll, we'll help you along with that today. Um, we are in a series where I'm just doing a little bit of teaching before we get into our next series in August. And uh, last week I talked out of, uh, or shared with you some passage out of uh, 1 Timothy, where we share the, the great truth and the great information of God wanting uh, everyone to experience salvation, uh, everyone to be freed from sin and death and to uh, have that great uh, knowledge that God loves us and God cares for us. And um, John Wesley, the person who helped start Methodism, put it this way. He said, um, all must be saved, all can be saved, all can know they are saved, and can know that they are saved to the utmost. And uh, this week we're talking about that short little part there that says, all can know they are saved. Now, I'll, I'll be honest with you that um, I really didn't think much of that when I was growing up. Um, the church that I was part of was, was wonderful, and I learned all the Bible stories and kind of figured out how to be a part of a church, you know, how to sit through a traditional worship service. I, I know my Apostles' Creed and my Nicene Creeds, and I know what to bring to a potluck, right? I, I had all that information, and yet... You know, I really never had thought much about it being real. You know, it kind of seemed like a, a nice story that we tell each other when we gather, right? And uh, there's little ones here, and so I can't really pull into this the way I would like to. But, you know, there's some things we tell kids that we really don't believe, right? Uh, and then on the other side of things, when they're older and we know they don't believe, we somehow continue to keep on that, that story going about what happens to their teeth, Right? Um, and how they disappear, and there's money that shows up. Uh, and then they get older, and you kind of wonder, do they still think the same things? And then they're like, yeah, I kind of hold on to that for my parents. Does that make sense? Like there's that kind of that rough understanding of, do we really all agree on these things? Do we really believe these things? And it really wasn't until I was a teenager, and I had somebody talk with me and say that they actually believe this stuff. And I was like, what is wrong with you? You know, my church, we kind of had a rough understanding of none of us really believe this. We just like to be together. And you seem to really have a conviction about this. Uh, and when I talk about you should know that you have salvation, like not only are we talking about the great news of spending eternity with God, but have you experienced the freedom and the joy and the hope that comes in Christ at work in your life? That, that's what I'm getting at. And uh, moving it from information to personal experience, personal knowledge, right? Y'all understand that. Like, I know that I can go and look at books or I can look at videos uh, of beautiful places like um, Alaska, right? And I've never been there. Um, I'm thinking right now it's, it's really nice up there compared to Beaumont and uh, that the weather's really beautiful and I would love to go and spend a great deal of time up there. If anybody wants to pay for that to happen next year, let me know. Um, but I've never been. You know, I've never set foot on ground there. I've never been a part of that, but I've seen it in the movies and I, I've read about it in books um, and I've had people come back and tell me, in fact, it's really wonderful. And so I don't really have any doubt that it exists. What I, what I can say is that I've never experienced it. And when we talk about, do you have assurance of your salvation? What we're driving at is, have you experienced it? Have you encountered it? Has it made a difference in your life? Has it had an impact? Have you experienced the peace and the joy and the hope that comes from knowing that God is at work in your life and that God has forgiven you and giving you the assurance of salvation. That's what we're talking about. And some would say that's not a big deal. Some would say that that's not even possible. And yet, at the very heart of who we are as a Methodist is that conviction that everyone should know that they have received salvation in their life, that that is a reality for them and that they have that assurance. The great news is God wants us to have it. God desires for us to know that. God loves us and wants us to know that. 
I mean, you think about it from the standpoint of, you know, good parents or good father, if they're about to go on a trip, they gather their kids up and they say, look, dad's going away for a while and uh, you don't need to worry. You're loved, you're cared for, uh, you're going to have everything you need and uh, I just want to assure you that I love you and I care about you and, and when I come back, I'm going to bring you good things, right? Uh, that's what, what a good parent would do, assure them and help them to know that it's just a temporary moment, a little time, and then they're going to be okay. Everything's going to be back to normal. A bad parent, a bad father would say something like, um, I'm going away, and uh, if you misbehave, I'm probably not coming back, right? Uh, if you're not good, um, I've, there's a good shot I'm just going to go find another family, right? Uh, that would be an example of a bad father, that they leave the kid without any kind of assurance that they're going to come back or that they're loved, right? If that's a, a problem for y'all, if y'all are getting that, talk with me later, and I'll help you with your parenting as well. But I'm just saying that would be an example of bad parenting if they just kind of left the kids like, you know, maybe I'm coming back, maybe I'm not, uh, maybe you're loved, and maybe you're not, right? Uh, but we have a father who loves us and cares for us and wants us to know that, wants us to experience that and receive all the gifts that come from that, right? And so that's what we're working at today. And um, uh, I want to share with you just a simple piece of scripture from 1 John chapter 2. Uh, this is the common English Bible. It says, He is God's way of dealing with our sins, not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. So this is scripture talking about Jesus, and it says he is God's way of dealing with our sins, not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. And so that's how it is in the common English Bible. And as I shared with you earlier this summer, in the King James, it's, uh, and he is the propitiation of our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And propitiation is a big word. Other words that it's translated there is that Jesus is the atonement of our sins, uh, and common English says he is the, the way that God deals with our sins, right? And we understand that usually only partially, only receive half of the good news that's there. Uh, the half that says that our, our past sins can be forgiven. And that's fantastic news, but it's only half. Half of a good thing is sometimes good enough, right? Half of a chocolate cake, still pretty good deal, right? Uh, if you're promised a million dollar inheritance and you only get half of it, you're still in pretty good shape, right? Uh, but when it comes to the gospel, we want the full promise, the full truth that's there. And so if half of it is that our sins can be forgiven, then the rest of the sermon is about the other part of that, right? That's what we'll talk about. The other piece that's there, and that first part is essential that God can forgive our sins and has given us Jesus Christ in order for that to be accomplished, that he died on the cross for us. He is the atonement, the propitiation of our sins, uh, our disobedience toward God, our sins against God and against other people. All of that can be forgiven through Jesus Christ. We can be put back in a right relationship with God, set in the place that we need to be. That's something that we need to know. That's something that is essential to us. And we need to know that he is God's way of dealing with our sins and the sins of the whole world. But like I said, that is just part of it, right? We oftentimes think of that as a historical thing, something that happened in the past. But as one pastor said, he's not just a, a dying savior, he's a doing savior. Like he continues to work in our lives, he continues to work in our world, continues to offer us all the help that he can give us, and that he continues to help us. And you say, well, what's the difference? What's the actual difference? Well, many times when I have conversations with Christians or people who are new to the faith, um, when they talk about their life and their, their faith life, it's a lot like they're on probation. Does that make sense? That they've been forgiven, they've been pardoned, and now they kind of look at their life as they're on probation. Like somehow God's up there just kind of like a bad probationary officer waiting for them to make any kind of mistake at all, right? That's kind of how they experience their, their life. 
they've been forgiven, you know, they come forward, they receive communion, they get told that they are forgiven, and they, on the way back to their seat, they's like, oh, get a clean slate. I know I'm going to blow it, but just a few minutes, I get to enjoy having a, a good relationship with God. It's like they're on probation, and one mistake, one false step, and they're doomed, right? So oftentimes, that's how people look at their salvation. Say, it's something that happened in the past, and now I've got every opportunity to blow it, kind of like me when I'm on a diet. I'm like, I'm one trip away from Happy Donuts, from losing everything I've worked for, right? And uh, that's how a lot of people look at how their relationship with God is, is that they're on some kind of really strange probationary period. And if they can just make it from now till the time they die without, you know, committing any more sins, then they'll be okay. And so you'll see a lot of people, they're like, when I get close to death, I'm going to live a good life, right? Is this too honest with y'all? I'm sorry. Uh, that we are looking at this situation today, and, and I hope you're beginning to kind of get your heads around it, that more than just something that happens in our past, we have a Savior that continues to work in our life today. Um, Jesus has ascended. He sits at the right hand of God. He is the great high priest that offers for us all the sacrifice we need so that we can have right relationship with God. So that is the simple truth I want to share with you. He's the propitiation. He's the atonement. He's the way of dealing with our sins, not only ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He continues to work in our life, continues to offer us help, continues to give us grace as we move through our daily life. So, are you making use of that truth? That Jesus is here now, present now, forgiving you now, offering you grace now. Are you living in that truth or do you live with a lot of guilt? You know, that's not a fun thing to talk about, but it's a reality that happens for a lot of us, a lot of Christians. Do you, do you live with a lot of guilt or a lot of shame? Do you, do you feel like you fail God constantly? Do you feel guilty about that? Do you feel like you don't live up to your own standards and so you feel guilty about that? Or have you ever had one of those really strange moments where you don't feel guilty and you feel a little guilty because you're not feeling guilty? Is that like... I'm speaking to some of y'all who came out of a Catholic church. I know I am. Um, that you, you have that, that guilt and that shame, right? And even when you can't think of anything you've done wrong, you're like, I should think of something I've done wrong, right? Feel, feel that kind of experience. And a lot of Christians, no matter their background, still kind of live with that kind of sense in their life that they're, they're guilty or they should be ashamed. But God has given us a Savior who continues to work in our life. One of the ways that First John talks about him is he says, he's an advocate. He works on our behalf. You know, when you have a, an advocate in the legal system, they work by proxy. They represent you. When they win, you win, right? And this is the same thing that John is talking about. He's saying because of what Jesus has done for us, we no longer have to face the accusations that would make us feel guilty. We no longer have to deal with the, the shame and the guilt that we once did because of what Jesus can accomplish for us. That when we think about our own unrighteousness, we need to rest in Jesus' righteousness, trust in his salvation, and let him do what he alone can do. Um, and let me just be clear. It, it's not... It's not that we have not made mistakes. It's not that we pretend like we somehow have lived a better life than we did uh, or anything like that. That this is a real impact on our life made by a real Savior. Let me, uh, let me reach all the way back into the 90s for an illustration. <laughs> way back when. There was a little book uh, written by a guy named John Gray, and you'll know the title. It was um, Women Are From Venus and Men Are From Mars. Any of y'all remember that? Did any of y'all have churches that did sermon series around that? Yeah, that happened. Um, we'll have to confess that. Uh, and, uh, but he, he came out with that. And it was a fun image about why marriages can be a struggle. Uh, but he had another part to his book that always bothered me. 
And it was that he would talk about how if you'd had a rough childhood, you know, like somebody had said mean things to you or done mean things to you when you were growing up, then what you needed to do was just rewrite that whole story. Like, you know, if somebody had said something bad about you, then you go back and you rewrite whatever it is they said that was bad and turn it into good things, right? Uh, that was his understanding. And, and maybe that's helpful for people, but I always looked at that like, well, that's not true. That's not what happened. That's not the reality that I live. And what I love about Jesus is he takes all of my pain, all of my guilt, all the things that I have done wrong, all the things that I have uh, found myself ashamed of, and he can deal with that in a real way. It's not like I have to somehow pretend like none of that happened or none of those things were not the reality of my life, but rather a real savior who deals with real sin in a very real way. That is what he can do and how he alone can free us from that kind of guilt or that kind of shame. The other thing that this should do for us when we think about the assurance it offers our lives is it should also help us with discouragement. You know, maybe you have found yourself feeling like you're on probation, right? And when you make mistakes, you get discouraged, or when you fail, you get discouraged, uh, or maybe you're just not joyful or uh, thankful for what God has done in your life. And so that makes you feel discouraged as well. But when you think about what Jesus has done for you, that he is the propitiation for your sins, uh, you should have a different story about what happens when you face temptation or what happens when you fail or the mistakes that you make. Let me give you an example. Uh, it's found in Luke chapter 22. And uh, this is around the time when Jesus is having the Lord's uh, la last supper with his disciple, disciples. Uh, he says, he looks at Simon Peter and he says, Simon, Simon, look, Satan has asserted the right to sift you all like wheat. Right? He says, Simon, bad news. Things are about to get worse. Uh, I'm going to be handed over. Judas is going to betray me. I'm going to be crucified and you're going to deny me. Like Jesus is fully aware of Simon Peter's frailty, of Simon Peter's sinfulness, Simon Peter's brokenness, his imperfections. He's fully aware of all that. He's also aware of the circumstances that he's about to face. He's like, you're going to face a time of trial. You're going to face a time of temptation. And, um, and then Jesus goes on. He says, however, however, I have prayed for you that your faith won't fail. Right? I mean, that's comforting. Jesus already knows the, the problems that we're facing, the struggles that you and I are going to face. And it says here that he continues to intercede for us, to pray for us. In the Gospel of John, it's like he prays hard for his disciples. He knows what they're against. He knows what they're going to face. He knows the struggles. And he says, oh, I, I know what you're going to face. I know what you're going to do. I know the problems that you're up against. And yet, I continue to pray for you. I continue to work for you. I continue to believe in what you can, can happen in your life. And then he goes on. He says, and when you have returned, strengthen your brothers and sisters. Right? And I, I love that passage just because Jesus tells Simon Peter, he says, I know who you are. I, I know how weak you can be. I, I know the realities of sin. I, I know what the evil powers of, of wickedness and evil can do in your life. I, I know the world that you're a part of, and yet I continue to pray for you. I continue to intercede for you. I continue to offer you grace and mercy and, and give you my spirit. I, I can do all those things for you. And then there's the hopeful part of it. He says, and when you return, right? He's saying not like when you continue to fail. He says, when you return, when you come back, when you realize the mistake that you have made or the sin that you have committed, he says, when you come back, strengthen your brothers. Strengthen the brethren is what the King James says. And he's saying, and come back and encourage one another and remind each other that God still has given us a Savior. Even when we fail, even when we make mistakes, God has still promised us salvation and assured us that it can happen. The last little piece I want to cover is about um, maybe you're anxious, you know. Maybe it's not a matter of guilt or discouragement, but maybe you're 
anxious. Maybe you're worried. I just want to invite you for a second. Something I, I noticed this week. I was thinking about times where, where I get anxious. And normally when I get anxious, it has to do with thinking that somehow I've disappointed somebody or I'm not meeting somebody's expectations. I don't know if that's true for you. But usually the moments where I feel like I've, I've become anxious is when I feel like I'm about to let somebody down or I have let somebody down or I'm not meeting their expectations or, or I'm not meeting God's expectations, church? Is that when you feel anxious as well? Maybe that's, maybe that's the case for you. I mean, lots of things can make us be anxious, like too much coffee, right? But on a deeper level, I know that's one of the things that causes it within me is like when I feel like I'm not worthy enough or I'm not doing what I'm supposed to or I can't quite figure out what the other person wants, that's probably the most frustrating one, right? And if you just have that one little verse that I read for you about a God who loves you and has given his son for you, that should tell you what God thinks of you, that you're loved, that you're accepted, that you're desired, and that you're cared for. And that should help with you the next time that you're struggling and wondering, am I enough? Is God pleased with me? The answer is, in Jesus Christ, absolutely yes. There was an ancient Christian writer by the name of Tertullian, and he said, uh, the good news of, of Jesus Christ is always crucified between two thieves. The good news of Jesus Christ is always crucified between two thieves. He says, there's always two thieves trying to rob the good news of Jesus Christ. And maybe you've experienced at least one side of this or the other. Uh, On one side, you have a thief that continues to tell you things like, you may be forgiven, but you're not accepted. You're forgiven, but you're still on probation. One false move, you're back in the penalty box, right? On one side of that is that continual look at it and saying, sure, you know, he'll, he'll forgive you, he'll let it go, but you're on thin ice. You know? How much longer do you really think God's going to put up with that? Right? That's one, one side of the cross, one, one thief. And then probably more prevalent in our world today is the other thief that says, why are you even worried at all? Right? This whole thing about sin, this whole thing about judgment, is it really that big a deal? I mean, God loves us. God's going to take care of it all. So why even bother trying to do anything that pleases God or honors God or is obedient to God? I mean, that's the other thief that just says, it's no big deal. It's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to be concerned about here. You're loved. It's all going to be fine. We all live how we want to live, do what we think is right in our own eyes. So why even pay attention to the good news of Jesus Christ. And in the middle is a Savior who says, you are loved, you are accepted, and sin's a real thing. It really is going to hurt you. It really is going to kill you. It really will lead to your death. That is the good news of Jesus Christ, a Savior that not only is honest and truthful about what sin will do to your life and how it will wreck you, but also graciously has been given to help us deal with our sin, help us to be freed from sin and to have life and life eternal through him. So, is it true for you? Have you experienced salvation in your life? Do you trust him completely, not only with the sins of your past, but whatever temptations and struggles you are facing today? Is that true for you? Another question I might ask you is, if it is true for you, have you, have you shown it to yourself? Have you evidenced to yourself? I mean, are you generous? Do you serve? Do you worship? 
Have you given your whole heart to Christ? Do you trust him completely with your, your family? With your pride? With your honor? Whatever it is that's sacred to you, do you trust all of that to him? And I would say, if you're not, then you really need to ask God to become real in your life. Really ask God to show you his salvation. Pray and plead for that. Work at it with great fear and trembling until you get to a place where you know for sure that you are a child of God, no longer an orphan, no longer a slave to sin and death, but a child of God, part of the household of faith. Pray that you come to know the, the heights and the depths and the riches of God's grace that he has shown you in Jesus Christ. Plead for that to be a part of your story so that you can have full assurance of your salvation and live for him and serve him and give all that you are into his mission. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we don't trust you enough in our daily lives. It, it may be that we know what you can do or we have an understanding of what you can do and yet lord we are reluctant to step out in faith we are hesitant to fully believe all the promises that you have made to us lord we so oftentimes fight you for things that we really don't want rather than receiving the free gifts that you alone can offer into our lives lord i pray for the people who have gathered here today and for those that are listening online, I pray that more than just having a, a passive understanding of what you can do, Lord, that they would experience it, that, Lord, you would free them from sin and death, Lord, that you would free them from whatever it is that they're addicted to or whatever problems that they are facing, Lord, I pray that you would deliver them, that you would save them, that you would bring them out of the place of shame or guilt or embarrassment or whatever it is that they struggle with lord we pray that you will continue to be a mighty god to them and graciously love them and encourage them and help them to know that they are your children that you they are your sons and your daughters and that we are part of a church that has come to know the great things that you alone can do be with us in the week to come help us to encourage each other and to strengthen each other in this truth help us to remind each other when we are struggling or failing that you have not given up on us but rather lord you continue to work on our behalf all these things we pray and ask in the name of the father the son and the holy ghost amen